Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us here today. We're so glad to have you with us. My name is Rashmi Malviarchi, and I'm the Group Program Manager for Windows IoT. Uh, my name is Sam George, and I am the Director of uh, Azure IoT. So today we're going to be jointly presenting on both Windows and Azure IoT. That's it. Go for it. Cool. Um, so uh, IoT is a significant uh, set of technologies that is fueling a lot of innovation. Um, we're seeing a lot of customer moment momentum across these customers, plus many, many, many others um, that are already benefiting from IoT, that are using it at scale in production. Um, IoT is a, um, can be a complicated topic, and part of what we're going to be talking about today is how we, as Microsoft, are simplifying it. So speaking of simplification, you know, there's a very simple way to think about IoT generally. And they typically boil down to these three components. You have these connected devices. And because those devices are connected, you get a chance to gather data. That data will allow you to derive insights. You can learn and understand more about how your business is working. And those insights can lead to action. But of course, there's a huge flaw in this very simple model, which is it's a little bit naive. The, the picture is actually a little more complicated. Um, you know, if you think about things, you're dealing with things like deployments and device recovery and device updates, uh, device provisioning. On the insight side, you have to think about where am I storing the data? What types of analytic techniques am I using to dri drive those insights? And then on the action side, you've got business process integration, management. Um, there, there's a lot to these IoT solutions. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, which is simplifying IoT. So uh, we're doing a set of things in, in regards to this. Number one is making it easier to build secure, scalable solutions from device to cloud so that you don't start with something that leads you down a dead end. Making it easier to provision devices at scale. One of the things we see is that even after a customer gets a IoT solution set up and running, um, you, can also, you can often hit bottlenecks uh, at various points in the implementation down the road when you start trying to scale uh, scale the um, deployment of those devices. And one of the bottlenecks that you can hit is just provisioning devices at scale can take a lot of time. Um, I, I'm very fond of saying that software is fast, but things are slow. Like I'm going to show you in a little bit that you can push a button, and five minutes later, you'll have a solution that can handle a million devices. But ordering a million devices and provisioning them and deploying them or connecting to a million existing ones, that takes real time. And so part of what we're doing is speeding up and simplifying uh, provisioning at scale. And then once you provision them and have them connected, one of the you know, naiveties that you tend to see a little bit in IoT is you know, that it ends there. And it's not. You know, there's a full, development or a full uh, device management life cycle uh, that you have to factor in to your deployments, both for security but also to take advantage of new functionality. And if you realize this too late and you have too many devices and you're rolling around trucks in order to update them, you're not going to have a super happy IoT experience. Um, easier to find insights from your IoT devices. Um, today, um, I, you know, finding insights from data in IoT devices um, could be difficult. And part of what we're doing as Azure is making it much, much easier. And we're going to show you some demos today of how we're, how we're significantly moving the needle and making it so that mere mortals can find ins rich insights from IoT data. Easier to take intelligence that you build uh, in, in the cloud and in solutions and drive it right down to the point of the device. One of the things that I demoed this morning in the keynote was the ability to take cloud logic like machine learning, Azure Functions, um, Azure Stream Analytics, and to be able to export it from the cloud and run it right on an IoT device. Um, that's, that's, about, that's part of what we're doing to simplify this. And then all of this really equates into how do I make it easier? How do we make it easier for all of you to benefit from IoT? You know, IoT is a new wave of technology, and with each new wave comes a set of benefits and a set of requirements. And our job at Microsoft is to satisfy as many of those requirements and make those easy so that you can reap the benefits. Cattle, <laughs> not pets. <laughs> no, those aren't my cows, but those are my dogs. And they're here to help me illustrate a pretty simple point. 
which is when you think about IoT, you should think about your devices as cattle and not pets. You've probably heard this analogy used with servers back in the day, when we used to name each server and care for it individually and worry about its particular policies, et cetera, et cetera. We really treated it like a pet. But the sheer number of servers that we needed, the servers that grew out there, it just didn't scale. And so the same is true for IoT. With IoT, you can't really scale if you have to consider each device individually and set up secure, special security policies, firewalls, what other configuration you need on a device-by-device -device basis. So you really need a solution that will help you scale, especially when it comes to security and management. And the more your device and cloud platforms do for you in that regard, the more you as developers can focus on doing what you do best, which is adding your own unique value. So part of our focus is, of course, that first one. Uh, we're going to go through each one of those points. First is about making it easier to build secure, scalable solutions from device to cloud. One of the things we introduced quite some time ago um, was a set of capabilities starting with the Azure IoT Hub. What Azure IoT Hub is is a fully managed platform as a service service available uh, in worldwide regions that enables you to connect millions of devices securely at high scale um, and to be able to securely manage those uh, to be able to receive telemetry from them, to be able to send commands, um, to be able to connect the world of things to the world of the cloud. Now, IoT solutions can be complex. You know, there's parts where there's, you know, cloud gateways like IoT Hub, there's analytics, there's business process integration, there's dashboards. And so what we realized early on was that we needed to start providing solutions that made it easier to get started. So a couple of years ago, we introduced the Azure IoT Suite which is a set of pre-configured solutions. Now, the way that works is it's a set of platform-as-a-service offerings, and we, imp we deploy those, which I'll show you in just a second. We will deploy those into an Azure subscription, wire them all together, and include a custom application. That custom application is open source, so you can freely modify it, and we have a lot of customers that actually start with that and then modify it to something that they need. Um, what we just announced recently, a couple weeks ago, is that um, we are going to be introducing what we call Microsoft IoT Central, which is a fully managed SaaS offering for IoT. And so think of it as just these are all uh, layers on each other. And so Azure Microsoft IoT Central is about making it easy to connect and manage securely to devices, um, to be able to drive insights from those devices, and then take insight or take actions in terms of communicating with existing business processes, for example, SAP, Salesforce, Dynamics, things like that, uh, and even having uh, uh, Azure Function extensibility to connect to existing uh, business processes, all while Microsoft, we as Microsoft are managing that entire solution for you. So you don't have to worry about scale, you don't have to worry about monitoring it. Uh, we're the ones that wear the pager and keep the whole thing running. So that's Microsoft IoT Central. And then on the, on the device side, Windows IoT Core provides uh, a number of benefits to use developers. It supports the languages and frameworks that you already know, uh, provides management functionality that we're, of course, building on our, our long heritage of management of the enterprise space, uh, natural user interfaces uh, and natural language processing, uh, edge compute, which we'll talk about and show a demo of, um, and then, of course, security and servicing. And each of these will go into more detail. So as much as IoT opens up new opportunities for customers, it really does the same for attackers as well. You know, last year we published a, uh, an infographic on this very same topic, and it showed some trends that we expect to hold true in the year 2020. You know, when I saw this, there were kind of four elements that really struck me. Uh, the first was the realization that 2020 is only just three years away, which I'm still having genuine trouble comprehending that fact. Two and a half. <laughs> That's right, two and a half. <laughs> um, you know, and by that time, we expect that about half of all large IoT implementations will need cloud-based security of some kind. And yet, only about 10% of an IT uh, security budget we expect to have actually spent on IoT solutions. Even in that situation, about 25%, about a quarter of all cyber attacks, we think, are going to target IoT at that time. So, okay, so what? Well, you need to be able to rely on a security solution that spans the entire system when you consider IoT. That goes from device to gateway to cloud. Windows IoT takes that same enterprise-grade security that we've built into Windows and brings that into the IoT space. There are lots of elements to this, and they all work with one another. 
um, again, spanning uh, uh, security solutions, spanning devices in the cloud. That includes things on the device for protection, such as BitLocker, Secure Boot, secure boot uh, as well as threat resistance from technologies like Device Guard uh, and security updates that we'll offer on Windows. And then that continues up to the cloud as well. Yeah. And so um, the, next, the next sort of click stop along this journey is making sure that the connectivity between devices uh, and the cloud are secure. Um, Azure IoT Hub, of course, supports X509 and TLS-based protocols, uh, X509 certificates as well as TLS-based protocols. Um, we also support a set of sophisticated uh, capabilities such as IP whitelisting and blacklisting, um, and to be able to have per-device certificates and to be able to turn them on and off. Um, we had to do a lot of work in the cloud in terms of security, from uh, encryption and REST for our services, to using Azure Active Directory and Key Vault for keeping solutions secure, policy-based access control so that you can lock down you know, specific parts of your solution to specific people in your, in your companies. Um, I already talked about IP-based blocking or IP-based IP uh, uh, whitelisting and blacklisting. And then part of what we're doing, what we announced recently, was uh, a brand new service we call the Azure IoT Hub Device Provisioning Service, which is about secure device registration at scale and to make it automatic. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. The other, some other things that we're doing in, in terms of security in the cloud, we have very concept comprehensive, what we call cyber physical security recommendations. Um, we've published many, many white papers about this. We've also recently started a program, actually late last year, called the Security Program for Azure IoT. And what that is, is a, uh, a program of third party uh, security auditors that come and audit customers' solutions, all the way from device to the cloud. Um, they will recommend, uh, they will identify uh, weaknesses and they'll recommend remediations. And so the whole idea is that you can find out, you know, what, where your weak points are uh, before the bad guys do. And then part on their response side, one of the reasons why we uh, delivered device management uh, last year before we delivered um, uh, device provisioning is that one of the most important parts of being able to secure an IoT device is to be able to uh, update it, right? Both the OS as well as applications running on it. Because there is no such thing as secure software. Um, you're always updating software. And so if you don't have a device management plan, you don't have a security plan. Um, device recovery and device specific repudiation are also things that we focus on. So we, we I, I hope what you can see is that left or right, we place a very high premium uh, on security all the way from devices all the way to the cloud. So I wanted to talk briefly about the Azure IoT Suite for those that haven't seen it. What the Azure IoT Suite is, is a, um, it's that set of uh, comprehensive services that we provision into account. I'll just do a quick demo of it for you and then we're gonna come back to it for some of the rest of our demos. So if I hop out of this, So when you go to azureiotsuite.com, what you'll wind up seeing is a set of solutions that you can provision. Um, we have a couple different versions. One is remote monitoring. Um, frankly, a lot of IoT right now is about remotely monitoring devices, you know, where they are, whether they're secure, whether they're on. Um, we have a connected factory one, which we just introduced, which enables uh, customers to connect to on-premises industrial pieces of equipment, uh, speaking uh, OPC protocols, which is a very, very important part of the IoT ecosystem and industrial IoT and in Industry 4.0, and also predictive maintenance that shows how to use sophisticated techniques like machine learning um, to predict the maintenance needs of IoT devices. And so creating one of these is as simple as selecting one of these templates, giving it a solution name. So in this case, if I give it build 2017, um, and simply pick a subscription. I just have some of my own internal ones. And then selecting a region, and these are all the regions where it's available in. So if I select East US, and then I just simply go and click Create Solution, what that's gonna do is go uh, initiate a whole bunch of services being provisioned, about 10 in total, as well as deploy all of that custom code. Uh, we'll come back to it later, but what you'll wind up seeing is that um, that will create an end-to-end -end solution, and then connecting devices to that just takes a couple minutes. And then out of the box, you've got an IoT solution. The way, what it looks like uh, once, once it's been provisioned is like this. 
And so what it includes is uh, a dashboard. We also, as part of this provision, simulated devices in the cloud that while this website is open, we'll send simulated telemetry so that you can see the telemetry coming through. Um, we have those disabled right now, which is why you're not seeing them. Um, you have a device list. You're able to manage devices through this. We just implemented device management as part of this. And so you'll see in a second, we're able to manage uh, IoT devices through this. You can also set rules, which wind up setting Azure Stream Analytics jobs um, for monitoring telemetry, and then take actions as a result of those. Um, and create management jobs, and you know there's places to add new devices as well. So if you haven't checked it out, it's a great way to get started. Um, you can also start really simply too, if you just want to get started with IoT Hub, by grabbing an Azure subscription, provisioning an IoT Hub, and if you want to see that data, you can provision Azure Time Series Insights, which I'm going to be showing in a second, connecting that to IoT Hub, and away you go. You'll be able to see your IoT data right away. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. So once I have IoT, uh, an IoT device or an IoT solution provisioned, um, one of the first things that I want to do is provision it. Now, IoT Suite has the ability to manually provision, where you simply tell it, hey, here's a device. Uh, I want to provision a device. You get a device ID. Um, you can connect the device using that. And you get a connection string and all that. But as I mentioned earlier in the talk, one of the challenges in IoT is once you start getting into the thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, Doing that manually is super painful. You can't, that it, it becomes very problematic. What you really want is the ability to automatically provision. So we recently announced a new service, this Azure IoT device provisioning service. We have another talk at Build that's gonna go into it in detail, but I'm just gonna cover it at a high level. So the whole idea here is that you have an IoT hub in the cloud, and you have a device provisioning service instance. Now, what the whole idea behind the device provisioning service is that you can pre-register a device with it and tell us which IoT hub you want it associated with. And you can do that in several different ways. The first way is to tell us statically. This hardware ID is going to get registered with this IoT hub. You can also do geo-sharding. So for example, if you, you imagine you're a multinational company and you've got IoT hubs around the world, and when a device wakes up and contacts this, whichever region that device is in, you can geo-shard and, and connect to the right IoT hub. And the other thing that, we're, that we'll be adding to the IoT Hub device provisioning service is the ability to invoke uh, an Azure function so that you can decide at runtime which, which IoT Hub it should be associated with. So the way this works is, so imagine in this scenario, I've got a manufacturer who's producing a device and a customer who's buying that. Um, so if the manufacturer is producing it for a certain customer, what they can do right at the time of hardware uh, manufacturing is burn in a hardware ID as well as um, our SDK which will preload and pre-point to this global endpoint. Now this is a globally available endpoint, and so uh, you can have a device pointed towards it, you can pre-register that device, and then it'll do the following. So imagine that you know, I've now shipped this device over to the consumer, the customer, or the customer, the customer's got it. The device turns on, and because that uh, SDK and that preloader was already uh, uh, loaded onto the device, when it turns on and gets network connectivity, it rendezvous with the Azure IoT Hub device provisioning service. That simply goes over to the correct IoT Hub, again, based on one of those three schemes, either static, geo-sharded, or uh, an Azure function at runtime. We'll register the device with the correct Azure IoT Hub and, ret and retrieve its credentials. It will do a credential exchange with the, with the device and send that back to the device, which then disconnects from the device provisioning service and connects to the, Azure, to the correct Azure IoT Hub. From there, it can simply initiate a provisioning workflow, and so um, it can download the latest software, firmware, become operational. So the analogy that I use for the device provisioning service is about 10 years ago, some of you probably don't remember this, but if you wanted to buy a mobile device, you would walk into a store, and some poor soul would have to sit there and program it for you. They would put in your, all of your data. Um, and today, when you buy a device, someone scans the outside of it. And you take it home, and you open it up, and you turn it on, and a bunch of magic happens. And then it becomes your device. This is the bunch of magic that happens that makes these IoT devices become yours and become operational without you having to manually program them. OK, so let's do a quick demo of that. Yes, we'll do a very quick demo of this one. I will grab a box here. Yeah, that's great. So here I'm, I've got a, a box of device. I want to go a little bit wider. 
got a box of the new device here that I can set up for all of you. And this device, just as Sam mentioned, when it came from the factory, it had that ID uh, burned to the image, burned into it. And you can see here, this is a uh, Keith & Cope uh, IPAN M7 starter kit with a Qualcomm Snapdragon SoC. Uh, and it's running Windows 10 IoT Core. So you can see I'm pulling it, pulled it out of the box. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in. This kit actually uses power of Ethernet. So the beauty of this is I can literally plug in one network cable, just one cable, and that's it. So you imagine in a customer site, all this would require is an installer will come by, mount this thing on the wall, plug in one cable, and leave. And because of Azure Device Provisioning Service, you don't have to worry about sending out IT to go and mess with this device in person at the customer site. They can just plug it in and go. So what's happening here is that the device is booting up. You can see it's, uh, it's starting just now. It's going to uh, look for a network connection. And as soon as it can connect to the device provisioning service, as Sam mentioned, it'll get back that URL. It'll download the provisioning. And there you have it. <laughs> so in this case, we're actually, all of us here in this room, we're part of this digital sign company. That's our scenario for these demos as we go on. Um, and you can see that this is running our digital sign now that just pulled down the content uh, right away. You can see how enthused we are. We are, we are on that sign there. So the we'll question get, is, we'll how, do we, how do we know how well this is working? Right? So we've got this sign out there. It's a smart sign. So what can we learn about that right. um, in real life? Yep. So the next uh, part of our journey is, is talking about making it easier to find insights uh, from IoT data. So um, there's many techniques that are part of this that are, that, are, that are involved in finding insights from IoT data. Most IoT data comes in in a time series fashion in terms of telemetry um, from devices. Um, and a typical scenario that you see is the first is using cold path analytic techniques, such as Azure Machine Learning. And this is where you know, I have a theory about what I'm going to find in the data. I apply machine learning to it. I run experiments. I split my data set in half. I test that with the half that I didn't uh, train the machine learning models on, and rinse and repeat, right? Um, now, if the device, if the data is fairly straightforward, I don't have to do machine learning with a cold, you know, I can do something simple like MapReduce. But oftentimes, if I'm doing something like predictive maintenance, where I'm taking data from machines and figuring out what are the label, you know, labeling it when they failed, and then asking machine learning to help me figure out exactly when, uh, what's gonna, what are the relevant signals that will predict a failure so that I can then, you know, predict it using live data. Um, this, you know, you, you really need some, uh, some, some solid data science to take advantage of machine learning. And we make it very easy once you have your feet on the ground, um, but you still kind of need to know what you're doing. Once you have those insights and you know what signals you're looking, to, looking for, um, traditionally what you see is you see um, uh, hot path analytics coming into play. What hot path analytics is, is taking those signals that now you understand um, you know, signify something that you're interested in. For example, that that device is going to break ahead of its servicing window, and operationalizing that. And by that, I mean as soon as data comes in, it's run through this. Typically, cold path analytics is referred to as cold because you're running it over historical, not moving data. Whereas hot path means the data is moving really quickly. It's coming in, you're evaluating it. Now, Azure Stream Analytics is a great system for that. Azure Stream Analytics enables you to simply create a SQL query with some SQL extensions for things like tumbling and hopping windows uh, or sliding windows. And so you can do things like, hey, select from these, select all these fields from my IoT data um, over a sliding five minute rate window. And for the moving average, score it against this machine learning module that I created in step one. And if the probability of, uh, of failure is greater than 80%, then trigger an event. And then something happens as a result of that. So that's you know, up until now, that's kind of what you did, right? You would do cold insights, you would operationalize those with a hot path analytics tool, like either Stream Analytics or something like uh, Apache Spark or Storm. Um, what we've introduced recently is warm path as well, where data is still moving, but you're looking at a much larger range. You're not just processing data as it came in and then storing it in cold storage. You're looking at a nice long range of data, typically a month or a couple weeks. Um, so Azure Time Series Insights is a fully managed time series store, as well as a user experience on top of that store um, 
that enables you to visually find insights in IoT data. And so mere mortals with very little training can find insights in their time series data um, using this. And it's really, really relevant to uh, IoT data, um, which is why we're super excited about this new offering. All right, so what Azure Time Series Insights does is once data starts flowing to it, it is a, um, you don't have to tell Azure, Street, Azure Time Series Insights um, about the schema of the data. It will infer the schema based on the data that it sees. If the schema drifts over time, it will adapt to that, and it will automatically index things. Um, and so it's very, very easy to set up. In fact, it only takes about 20 seconds. You provision it, you tell it which, I, which event source to get its data from. For example, IoT Hub, it supports others. Um, and then it'll just start collecting data. Super, super easy, and then you can go uh, exploring. Has a bunch of different views. Um, you can see weighted averages, you can see heat maps, you can see all sorts of pi and bar charts. So um, to show it off, so the scenario here is, you know, we have these signs that Rashmi just showed. Well, let's say that there's, uh, you know, a whole bunch of them, and what we, and one of the things that they track is user engagement, right? We're a sign company, so we want to measure or not, whether or not a sign's being engaged. And by being engaged, we're tracking proximity. How many people or how how many people are stopping and looking at this thing, and how close are they? Um, and so to find something like that. Um, we would simply bring up Time Series Insights. Let me just show you. So this is what uh, Time Series Insights looks like. And I can see all my different sources of data. I have a couple in here. Uh, the one that we have for today is this one, this Build 17 Azure Win 1. And what I can do is set the data that I want to look at. Now, I could go look at all sorts of data across ever since this has been collected. Um, and so what I'm gonna look at is the last 60 minutes. Let's go ahead and click search. Now what this shows is all, all the different devices that I have. And so if I want to measure, for example, events that are coming in, and I can have it split by device ID, so all the unique device IDs, this is all part of the schema that it's adapted. It's realized that, hey, there's device IDs as part of this tel each, each telemetry, as well as um, the number of events that are coming in. So I can see that, and I can't really see anything here. And if I, for example, decide, hey, I'm gonna look at proximity by device ID, now I can start to see a pattern. And what I can see is that um, I have an outlier. So I have four signs here, or three signs here, where the, proc where the engagement is actually quite high, where people are you know, stopping and looking at the signs, they're up close, and there's one where it's quite poor down here. Um, and so then using this, I can decide, I can figure out visually whether or not my signs are being engaged. And I can even, let me just show you this real quick, if I wanted to look at the raw data, I can e either, even drag this, open it up, and explore the events. And what this shows is that the raw data this is all the raw data that came in as part of Time Series Insights that was simply sent through IoT Hub from these devices. And I can filter these, look in all sorts of different ways. These are all the different live views. So these are, these are different slices of the views. Um, for example, this is a heat map view of the exact same data that I just showed. So that here I can see this is um, poor engagement down here. This is good engagement at the top. And so here I can see that, yep, indeed, my, uh, my first sign has poor engagement. Now, the next question to, to ask yourselves is, so what do we do about it, right? We have a sign, do we you know, put somebody in a truck to go fix it? And that's where device management comes into play. So, when it comes to device management, um, you know, we, we've, we've talked again and again this, uh, this afternoon about scale. And to make IoT work at scale, you've really got to think about your devices throughout the entire life cycle of those devices, represented here by these five steps. And so Windows IoT and Azure IoT cover you throughout that device life cycle. With little upfront planning right at the beginning, you can manage all these devices remotely. You can avoid having to send service people out on a truck to every single physical device when something goes wrong. And so up front, you'll want to define groups of your devices that you can target for access control and bulk management operations. Um, as we showed you with the Azure DPS demo for device provisioning, uh, you can make provisioning as simple as just plugging in a cable and away you go. Uh, and then when it comes to configuration, in order to facilitate bulk configuration changes and updates, 
um, uh, you can manage that all with the same set of groups that you defined up front. And then again, for monitoring, you'll want to be able to see the overall health of your device collection, the status of any ongoing operations, and alert operators to any issues that might require their attention. And then finally, you need to plan up front for how you'll retire those devices. You know, maybe you'll need to replace a device because uh, it had a failure. And in that situation, as always, you can use the device twin that's up on Azure uh, to be able to maintain the info, maintain the state, even after that physical device is being replaced. Or maybe you'll have to decommission a device because it's at the end of its service lifetime. Um, and, uh, and you'll be able to do all that if you, if you plan up front that way. Now, Windows IoT supports OMA DM, uh, which means it'll actually work with a wide range of, of uh, mobile device management solutions and plug into an IT organization's uh, DM solution. But that will only give you a certain level of scale. When you really talk about global scale, when you talk about our sign company that's doing very well, selling all these different signs around the world to multiple customers, you need massive scale. And for that, it's Azure Device Management. So I thought I would spend just a, just a minute explaining how Azure, device, Azure IoT Hub device management works. Um, so the way it works is, so on, on, on one side of the uh, slide, I have IoT Hub. On another side, I have an IoT device. Uh, we have SDKs. Um, that work on any device um, that you can use to communicate with IoT Hub to orchestrate device management. So let me show you how this works. Uh, until we had device management, there was really two channels in IoT Hub. If you ignore all of the uh, device, uh, device, identif I device ID, device registry, and things like that capabilities, you had the telemetry channel, uh, which is, hey, device is sending telemetry to the cloud. Um, you know, in the, in the demo that I just showed, it goes to Azure. Uh, time Series Insights or Azure Storage or wherever. And then the device is receiving commands. Now this is multiplex, so it goes over the same uh, TLS connection. Um, but there's really two, there was really two different channels. And what we introduced with device management back in November was a concept of a de device twin. And what a device twin is, it's about state synchronization between remote disconnected devices at extreme scale to be able to do it across millions and millions of devices. So. We have a device, uh, we updated our SDKs so that they have this capability of device twins. There's also a device twin that you'll see in IoT Hub. And each, each device that you register with IoT Hub gets its own device twin. And I'll explain what's in it in just a second. One of the things I do want to point out is that there were many, 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 many IoT Hubs in, in production uh, that customers were using for production workloads before we shipped device management. And we shipped it uh, last November. When we, ship, when we ship device management, over a period of about two days, we updated every IoT hub worldwide with this capability. Zero downtime, all the solutions kept working. And so one of the reasons why I want to highlight that is that as we continue to innovate on IoT hub, you just get new capabilities. You don't have to stop and migrate your devices to a new IoT hub or anything silly like that. You just simply get new capabilities. Now, you only pay for the capabilities that you're using. So if you're not using device management, you're not paying for device management. Um, so device twin. Um, what a device twin is, is a synchronized set of state. And that state follows, uh, comes from a couple different property collections. Now, each one of these property collections is simply a collection of name value pairs uh, using JSON data formats. The first property collection is desired properties. Now, desired properties is owned by the cloud, owned by the device twin in the cloud, and it's synchronized or replicated down to the device. There's reported properties, which are owned by the device and are synchronized or replicated up to the cloud. These two are, we do not reconcile the two. This is, the, this is how the two-way communication happens. We synchronize them, but um, they each, you know, one is cloud-owned, one is device-owned. So as an example, um, if we were to be doing device management in this room, um, you know, there's a bunch of IoT devices in here. We would need a way to organize and group them so we can find them later. And that's what this third collection that's cloud only is for, which is called tags. And what tags is, is just arbitrary name value pairs. So for example, we could say, hey, you know, we'll tag all of these devices with this room. The next room over, we tag them with a different room. And then later, I'm going to show you on the next slide, we have query capabilities so you can go and retrieve them later and get device twin collections back. So once I've figured out the device twins, if I wanted to update them, a typical device management scenario is I've coordinated with my, you know, my team, my OT team, um, who's responsible for keeping the device running. 
and I have an update window. And so I would push out an update window to the device through desired property change in the cloud. That would be replicated down to the device. The device would then turn around and set a reported property to acknowledge receipt of that property. Um, and then the cloud, at the cloud, your solution can query and see which devices are, are at equilibrium and know what their update window is. Then you could push down you know, new URI for a software package to download, any configuration and things like that. And using these two property sets, you can manage, you can fully manage the software and firmware and configuration of uh, remote disconnected IoT devices. Now the best part of this is that um, when you make changes to desired properties, for example, or when a client makes changes to reported properties offline, we have batching capabilities on both, both ends so that we'll simply batch those up if the device happens to be disconnected from the network at that time. Let's say it's using cellular connectivity on the device and it's in a tunnel, for example. When it reconnects, we'll simply uh, resynchronize the reported properties and the desired properties. There's also the notion of, with the vice twin of methods, which is the ability to invoke a command on a device and receive an immediate response. So for example, if you wanted to tell a device, dump your telemetry and you know, send it back to me, um, you could use a device method. And then on top of this, we have both jobs and queries. And what queries are is the ability to query over millions of device twins across their reported properties, desired properties, or tags, and find any device twin sets you want to find. You can find which ones are out of equilibrium, which ones are disconnected, which ones you know, need updating, which ones have finished updating. And then jobs are, if you think about the problem of, hey, I want to update five million devices over the next you know, week. You can cre simply create a job for that, schedule it to start whenever you want, and we'll manage that long-running process and keep all that state alive in IoT Hub and track how that job's performing, how many, jo how many jobs have been executed and on which devices. All right, so this supports any operating system, but Windows IoT Core has libraries that make this super, super easy. So you can simply use those on your Windows 10 IoT device. It replicates or integrates out of the box uh, with Azure IoT Hub device management. So let's, let's see it in action. We'll hit the uh, camera here. Actually, should we start? Let's start in the... Yeah. Yeah, we'll start in that one. Okay, so we're going to show you uh, Azure IoT Hub device management. Let's go. I think it's the wrong mouse. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So as Sam showed you, uh, here we are in, uh, um, uh, in the IT suite. You can see that there are a number of devices here. I've actually got one of our signs running here, uh, and it's, it's feeding back some telemetry data now. Um, and as you saw, some of this data was also available in time series. When I go to devices, in this case, what I'm going to do is, just as Sam mentioned in the uh, time series demo, we've gotten a lot of telemetry from devices that are out there in the wild. And we found that one of those signs is actually not getting as much engagement. And the reason for that is that that particular sign was configured to, set, to show a certain design for that sign, a certain visual design for that sign. And so we're actually going to go and update that now remotely to go and show the one that all the other signs are, are showing in the hopes of getting that engagement. So here you can see I've got my list of devices here. Uh, and along the right-hand side, you can see there's all kinds of properties that are coming back from the device. And all this stuff comes up for you automatically uh, because this device is running Windows 10 IoT Core. So I'm going to invoke a method, just as Sam mentioned. And I'm going to uh, I'm gonna give it an app lifecycle message, pick the app that I want, and I'm going to say start. And so this is really just saying to the device, OK, device, I want you to flip over to the one that um, the other, the alternative sign. So let's hit the camera. Unfortunately, we can't show you both screens at the same time, so yeah. we're going to show you the device that we're going to send the method to. And this is live. It's coming from uh, Azure. OK, so there's our sign. You can see this is the one that wasn't getting uh, great engagement. I realize now that I've lost my screen. And I'm going to invoke the method. You can see the sign responds immediately. <laughs> and now it's got a much better sign, much more engaging, um, and uh, we should see much better telemetry coming back from this one. So our silly example shows how you know, I don't have to drive trucks anymore in order to manage these devices. Um, I can simply manage them from the cloud, 
and with the integration that Windows has done um, with, with libraries that integrate with Azure I IoT Hub device management, makes it easy to manage devices at massive scale. So, what if? You know, in that demo, we showed you, I showed you a large set of properties that were shared between the device and its twin up in Azure. Part of the reason for exposing all of these properties is that you don't always know what you'll need until you need it. So for example, say you've got thousands of these signs that are deployed to your customers around the world. You've built this awesome digital sign. Uh, it's got a beautiful experience for your customers. They love it. It's deployed. You're getting valuable insights about their businesses. Success, right? Well, now a customer comes to you and says they're upgrading their network and they're going to require certificate off to be able to make sure for any device that wants to get network connectivity. Without the right cert, your signs are going to get disconnected. Well, you were focused on building a digital sign. Did you happen to think about cert off when you built your solution? If not, you're going to be in trouble. You're the digital sign expert. You build beautiful UI. You enable your, your customers to create awesome experiences. That's what you're selling, and that's where you should focus your effort. Your platform should have your back and make sure this kind of thing is super easy for you when something like this comes up. So Windows 10 IoT Core exposes lots of management properties for you in a standard model. And these are just some of the properties we, we make available to you. We have an open source client sample that will connect the most commonly used properties right up to Azure DM for you, and we're adding more all the time. And the whole point of this is, by choosing the right platform and cloud um, pairing, you can remain focused on building your app and adding the value that you individually want to add. So let's switch over to talk a little bit about, uh, about edge intelligence. Um, you know, in the, in the keynote this morning, you heard uh, Sam and Satya talking about uh, Azure IoT Edge, which will make it even easier for you to move intelligence from the cloud to the edge. That's still in development, of course, but we have a demo here for you that combines a similar principle with computer vision. We put together over here on this rig a rock, paper, scissors game that uses machine learning to try to beat the odds. And the principle is pretty simple. The hypothesis is that humans aren't truly random. There are subtle patterns that will emerge over time. And so if you play enough rounds against the same human, you can start to pick up those patterns. And so we thought, well, why not use the cloud to see if we can find those patterns? So this device won't win all the time, but it should certainly beat the odds um, if played enough. So what you're going to see is an Intel Joule running Windows 10 IoT Core. You can see it's mounted on the back of our awesome rig over here. It's using OpenCV for uh, computer vision, and the Cognitive Toolkit is playing two roles here. It's up in the cloud to train the model, and then that model is synchronized back down to the device to evaluate locally on the edge. And since the app is UWP, when our developers were writing this app, they found it super easy and fast because they would write in the language they know and the model they know with the dev environment they know. And then whenever they wanted to test it out, they didn't have to keep deploying to the device. They were able to just deploy it right on their dev box, right on their PC, make sure it ran, and then, uh, and then they could continue their development. So let's check it out. Now, if you can switch me over to the camera, please. Here we have the rig. You can see it's got um, the camera there. You can see the screen in the background, the touch screen running, uh, uh, running our little interface. And what's going to happen is, as I put my hand in here, you can see that based on what I'm throwing with my hand, if I can get some focus there, the machine will figure out what it is. Now, we could be cheating here, of course, but I want to assure you that the evaluation engine is not using the camera input at all in making its decision. So we're going to play a round. A round uh, the, the game includes three rounds. And uh, I'm going to ask all of you for help, because I'm trying to defeat this machine. So uh, when I hit play, I'm going to ask you to shout out whether, want, whether you want me to throw rock, paper, or scissors. First round, what's it going to be? I heard rock. We lost. OK, come on. One more. I heard rock again. <laughs> OK, last one. It's our last chance. Scissors? scissors. OK, scissors it is. Draw. <laughs> so you can see our computer has some rage issues, certainly. But it's also got a pretty good track record. So what you're seeing here in the all-time stats 
is uh, this device you can see on the blue, it probably might be hard to see on the screen there. The blue is the AI wins, the red are human wins, and the green are the draws. And this was played over, uh, looks like a few hundred games, probably about five or 600 games. Um, and you can see that over time, it's learned some patterns and it's been able to, uh, to keep its winning streak. So it's a good example of how we can use uh, Azure um, and, and uh, uh, cloud training to train our model and then be able to evaluate it locally because you need to be able to run fast on the device and uh, uh, make sure you can make the decisions uh, here. And then if there is a, a connectivity issue at some point, you could imagine this thing would batch up some games, send that telemetry back up, the model would get better, and then it would go back down to the device again. So part of what we covered today was you know, all the ways, sort of a whirlwind tour of all the ways that we're simplifying IoT, everything from solutions at scale to finding insights to provisioning to device management to even infusing intelligence. Uh, on the Azure IoT side, we have other sessions uh, at Build um, that go much, much deeper into, into all of these, and we've uh, announced all of these features that I'm showing you, showing you now from our security program and the security partnerships to device management. Um, there's a great feature called message routing that I don't have to, time to go into right now um, that makes it easier to develop uh, solutions at scale uh, in the cloud. Device provisioning service connected factory we talked about. This morning we announced Azure IoT Edge. St Azure Stream Analytics will run in it as well. We announced Azure IoT, or Microsoft IoT Central, as well as Time Series Insights. Um, I hope you can see from this slide that IoT is very important to Azure and to our customers. Uh, and we are very much all in and very, very aggressive about getting out the features that customers need in order to be successful in simplifying IoT. <coughs> Excuse me. You can also see that um, there's a lot of new recent innovations <clears throat> in Windows 10 IoT Core. We talked about the security solution, the turnkey security that we offer you. you showed, we showed you Azure IoT uh, Hub device management, device provisioning, and Edge. We've also got a bunch of new productization resources out there. In fact, right after this talk, I'm gonna publish a, a, a blog post that will uh, launch our new website, um, which uh, we've got a link to right in the next slide here. Um, we've also, with the Windows 10 Creators update, added support for Project Roam, which you may have heard about. There's some sessions going on over the next couple of days about that. Cortana support also available on Windows 10 IoT Core. We've got a, a ton of new controls, embedded features, things like the vibration API, um, connected standby, et cetera, um, and then there's app servicing via the store. There's also an exciting announcement I'd like to share with all of you uh, regarding platforms and SOCs. So working alongside our partners at Intel, I'm very happy to announce that in addition to Baytrail, Apollo Lake, and Joule platforms that are supported today, Windows 10 IoT Core will also be supported on the Cherry Trail and Braswell platforms in the very near future. But in addition to that, I'm even more excited to announce that moving forward, Windows, IO 10, Windows 10 IoT Core will be supported across Intel's full range of processors. That includes the Core, Pentium, Celeron, and Atom lines. It's outstanding support that we're getting from Intel. And all of this will give all of you more choice and more power for your devices and bring those to market. So, um we're going to have uh, questions and answers, and while we do, we'll leave this up. Um, it's some things that you can do right now um, from uh, visiting the IoT exhibits. Um, you, everything that we showed today is live, and you can try it today. Um, we also have some great resources online. So if you have a question, our ask is to find your way up to a micro microphone uh, and uh, ask it so everyone can hear, and we'll do our best to answer your question. And as you're making your way up there, we also wanted to show that there's a bunch of related IoT build sessions uh, uh, happening over the next couple of days, so please check them out. Please, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I had a question about the uh, servicing for IoT devices. So this is all based on the FFU servicing, which is kind of one, one bundle that has to be kind of uh, uh, built and distributed by the vendor of the device, right? Is that, is that correct? You're talking about on Windows. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Windows so, yeah, yeah. so Windows IoT, um, we actually have a, uh, there's a great session going on on Friday for commercializing your device that will cover some of the update options that you have there. Um, the interesting thing there is that the servicing story needs to be decided about whether it's going to be managed by the customer as like an enterprise device or by the OEM as a service provider. But you do have that option as the OEM, as a device builder, to be able to provide your own servicing updates. Okay. So. Um, Sounds, sounds good, I'll be sure to go to that. But one question I had for Microsoft is, if you guys have some kind of a crucial security fix, 
that you need to put out there, you, under this model, don't have direct control over being able to, to disseminate that to, to the affected customers. You're reliant on either the device vendor or, or the customer under one of those two models that you it, talked about. Is that true or is there some way that you can kind of piecemeal service uh, the OS components in an FFU image? It actually depends on the customer's choice. So if the customer chooses to receive security updates from us, then of course we can just send those things right away. Um, but if the customer chooses not to, we have to respect their decision to make sure they've got a, you know, they have their own testing requirements, their own validation requirements before they push out updates. And they, they don't want, um, what we've heard very loud and clear from customers is, they want to make sure they can be in control before updates get applied to the device. So both models are possible. It really depends on what the customer chooses to do. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. When it comes to provisioning and the, the the time series insights, are those available via API? So if I wanted to expose some of the functionality to my yeah, business units, they'll both be available. Yeah, so time it. series, in, just to be clear too, time series insights uh, is available right now in public preview. It, it has both that user interface that I showed as well as APIs, so you can just push, push data to it. Uh, Azure, uh, Azure IoT Hub device provisioning service uh, is in private right now, and it'll be in public preview soon. And that also has uh, command line APIs, so yeah. Yep. Is, does, all, does all the SDKs support the um, device mirror uh, and the uh, methods now? Because when it came out, it was only Node.js that supported these. It was only what? Node.js. Uh, um, so uh, at this point, I believe we're, we've covered all of our languages. Um, but for MQTT, um, we're finishing up on AMQP as well. Um, for those that aren't aware, IoT Hub supports three protocols. Um, from between devices and cloud, AMQP, MQTT, as well as HTTP. So Device Twin initially went out over MQTT, um, and I think we've, I'm pretty sure we've finished up all the languages on that. Um, and just for context, we support a variety of languages from C to Java to Node to Python to C Sharp um, to meet developers where they are. So yeah, and the AMQP support is coming in pretty, pretty soon here, a couple month or so. Cool. Did we really answer everyone's question? Or no one, no one has, no one has any, any other questions? Well, if you think about more questions that come to you later, uh, please come visit us at the booths um, or the, the set of other sessions that are going on today. We hope you really enjoy the rest of your time here at Build, and thank you very much for coming. Thanks a lot.